All right. A lot better, right? All right. I appreciate it. Um, so we're just so grateful that you're here. My name is Domingo. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just so honored to be able to speak to you guys today. So we are going to have an uh, amazing time going through several scriptures, but at the end of the day, we're really breaking down one scripture, because the Word of God is so powerful. So we're going to start with that scripture, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we got there. So the scripture I want to share with you guys is 2 Timothy 4.7. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. Okay? That hit my heart so hard over the last several weeks when I think back to my life 13 years ago. My life, I can only be described really in one way. At that point, it was beautifully basic. There was nothing to fight for, and I could not describe myself as a fighter. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father God, we just love you so much. We just stand in awe of you at every turn. We thank you for the way that your Holy Spirit goes before us and speaks to our hearts and prepare us. God, we thank you to be here today so we can corporately worship you because there's nothing greater than you in our lives, Lord. We just love you in your heavenly name. Amen. Awesome, awesome. So let me tell you where I was 13 years ago. 13 years ago, I was an atheist. I did not believe in God. Didn't believe he existed didn't believe that he was for me. If I didn't think he was there, I definitely didn't think he was for me. But when I say that my life is beautifully basic, it's that I had gone through so many hard things, but I was in a place where it felt like I was coasting. I had gone through a divorce, I had gone through hard things in my childhood, hard things in my life, but at that point in my life, I had good friends, and they were party friends, so I thought they were super good friends. We had a great time all the time. Work was good, finances were good, so everything looked good. But I had this kind of ache, this hole, something that was missing that I couldn't seem to fill it with anything. I didn't know what to do about that. I didn't know how to fill it. But I knew that I wanted something bigger and more than where I was. Right? And so this sounds like a horribly bad joke, but this is what my life was. There were two atheists sitting in a bar talking about how to make an eternal and big impact without believing in an eternal and big God, right? I was one of those atheists. So I'm sitting there with my best friend at the time, and we're talking about how we can make a difference. What does it look like? And you know, God will work through everybody. Whether you believe in God or not, he will use you in moments that you never thought. You can look back after you have a walk with God and go, oh, God was there. God was providing. God was doing. And this is one of those moments, because my atheist friend shared something good. And all goodness comes from God. She said, I mentor. I mentor, and it makes me feel like I'm making a difference. So I asked her, what did that look like? What, what did your mentoring look like? She mentored a 10-year-old girl. She said the school was close to her work or her home. She said I was able to go over there. I spend one hour a week with her, and we have lunch, or we talk, we just share, and I'm just able to you know, be nice to her, love on her, and share back and forth. And it's been great. So to me, that sounded amazing. That sounded perfect. Now, I'm, I want you to hear these statements. I want to make a big eternal impact. This sounds great because it sounds easy, close to my work or school. It's only one hour, and it's in a controlled environment. If it's not working out, teacher can come in. I can send her back to class, whatever that looks like. So to me... I still was not a fighter. It wasn't something to fight for. I still wanted to do something big, but I wanted it to be easy. So I go to the same agency she went to, figured I'd sign up for the program, right? Sounds simple. So I go there, and the lady who runs the agency is so kind, but the minute she starts talking, it just sounds like work. She starts pulling out papers. I have a whole bunch of programs. You can mentor in all these different ways, and I'm listening to her, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to read things. I don't want to read things. I came to sign up and show up. Like, that's where I was at. And so I'm listening to her, and I'm just letting her talk some more. Um, and so I, I finally was just like, I'm not, I don't know where you want to put me. You can put me anywhere. She's like, that's great. I'm glad you're open. Then she proceeds to tell me, if you really want to make a difference in a child's life, it's one hour a week at least for a year. And we see those changes 
and kids' lives where their confidence is stronger, where their lives are better, where they have better community and trust. And so I heard that, I'm like, are you? Are you? I was thinking maybe the summer, <laughs> maybe for a few weeks, see if I like it. You know, but in that moment, I'm just listening. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm actually going to pin a pin in that one because I think we need to hear this. That's almost everything we do at Passion Life Church. You want to make an impact in kids' lives? A little over an hour once a week, kids' area. You want to make a difference in a youth's life? A little over an hour a week in a kids' area, in a youth area. You want to make a change in your own life? A life group, most of them about an hour to two hours. About weekly. See what it looks like for a year. You want to change? You have to do something bigger. You have to do something with commitment, something with uh, a push and a drive. But this is the other thing she told me. She looked me up and down and said, it might be hard to find you a match. So I said, why? She said, because you're short. Real life guys, because you're short. That did not hurt my feelings. I'm not. I, I have no problems with my height. I love the way God designed me. It always works out for me well. Um, but she looked at me and said, the reason being is a lot of the kids that we work with come from broken homes, a lot of fatherless environments, a lot of kids that have been hurt and a lot of kids that are in foster care. And they're looking for a fighter like we saw on the screen. They're looking for a dad that's big and will fight and will defend them because someone in their life has not fought for them. That's what they've experienced. And I totally understood that. That did not hurt my feelings. So she said, it could take us a long time to find you a match. I'm like, that's fine. I'm fine with it. So I walk away with that going, oh my gosh, it's not exactly what I thought. Now I don't know where this program is because I said I was open. I don't know where, what kids you're going to match me with. That could be a long time. You want a year? A year? Anyway, I'll look at that. So I let it go. Three days later, she calls me and says she found a match. So my decision-making process had to speed up a little bit, right? I had to decide whether I was going to do it or not. So I'm like, tell me a little bit of, you know, how you found my match. She goes, well, I found this kid, and he's been in the foster care system since he was born. He's gone through multiple failed adoptions, which means that at some point you thought this was your forever home, and then it wasn't. And that could be good or bad on, on all parts. We don't, you know, you can't always blame parents or kids or what the dynamic is. You, you don't know what that looks like. But just to know that that was a forever home and then it's not, there's hurt there, of course. They said he's 14 years old, and he fights for everything. And he's physically violent and has intermittent explosive disorder, which means that he gets angry and might punch you, punch a wall, and they've had a lot of problems with him. But we think you guys would be a great match. <laughs> right? She was selling it hard. I was like, uh, okay. So what does it mean to be a good match? What, what do you see from me that's a good match with him? Well, he's on the shorter side and you're short. So and you seem well-adjusted. Well so we were hoping maybe you can show him that. Now, guys, let's be real. Shorter than me is not that short. Like, I'm really short. Or, excuse me, he's taller than me, but short on the shorter side. So I look at all that and I go, okay, we may think it's a problem, something in your life that God has designed in you. But it's not. God designed you for what he's going to call you to. Right? So if you find a perfect match, it works out amazing. Okay, so at this point, God's not in my life. So I want you guys to know that. I am not making a decision based off a prayer or a confidence in who God is or a confidence in what God is going to do. I didn't have that. So I'm making my decision going, I think it could be good. I can give it a shot. Right? So I meet this kid, and it's an instant relationship. Every heartstring for me was pulled, and I'm not a nice person, but at the time that was a lot. I was like, oh, wow, my emotions are there. And he tried so hard. So there's a kid who's already angry, already violent, and as our relationship developed that one hour a week, he's decided to change behavior, and instead of fighting a person, he was fighting himself behavior-wise and the way he would approach things so that we can spend time together. Because we can't leave that campus until we behave, until things work out. Now, I've got to tell you what this campus is. He's in a foster facility, the way they designed it, and he had gone through so much hurt, it's 
campus style environment. Everything is done there. Counseling, doctor comes there, it's group home style. The idea is they have to prepare him to be able to even go into a home. A foster home or an adopted home. He wasn't emotionally ready. He wasn't prepared. He had so much healing to be able to make that step. Okay? So we're here. We're spending time together. It's powerful time in both our lives. And here I'm thinking I'm making a difference. Little did I know that God was making a difference in me through him. So within two, three months, my wonderful friend is inviting me to church. I'm like, you just bought a staff member and you want me to go to church with you? Like, I don't even know where this is at. Like, you, you have a lot of poor decision making right now. Uh, where I, no. And so I said no. Now, mind you, he knew I was an atheist. Four months. He asked me to go to church with him. Now, these weren't badgering moments, because I always think of someone Bible coming, you need to go to church. No, not, nothing like that. It was, hey, can you take me to church? No. Hey, it would be great if we went to church together. No. I went to a church I liked. We should go back and visit it. No. Like, we're not going to do that. That's not, that's not who I am at the time. So he says, he asked me, how much do they pay you to hang out with you? And I was like, they don't pay me at all to hang out with you. He's like, okay, because I feel like I can do this. I can hang out with people and help them. <laughs> like, yes, you can. 14 is an amazing age. You know everything, right? And so at this point, what I realized is he knew many things, and one of the things he knew was who his Savior was. He knew Jesus. So through all, through all the things he's struggling through, he knew he loved Jesus and that Jesus loved him. And I didn't have that. So I looked at his life that was broken and disheveled and and so much healing that was needed, and I just didn't understand that confidence. Now, for any of us, we all struggle with this. We don't always know lordship at the same time we know a savior. So our lives don't always look perfect. It's a walk, right? So his walk was what it was for a 14-year-old coming from that environment and that family. So he asked me, you don't get paid anything, all right. I'd love for you to go to church with me because I feel like I don't want to be in heaven, knowing you're not in heaven. That's powerful, right? A life-changing statement. I said no. <laughs> it, there are so many moments in my life that I can share where I'm like, wow, if, we, if I would have said yes, God would have sealed that with such a beautiful bow. But I didn't. I was stubborn. I was hard. So I said no. So then he says again, in a different way, next time, I would love it if you took me to church. I said, you have all these people here that take you to church. You really do. You've gone with the group home. You've gone in these other environments. And he's like, yeah, but none of them are like just my friends. They're paid to be here. You're right now my only friend that's not paid to be in my life. That pulled some heartstrings. So I said very nicely, if I can find a church that doesn't speak hate from the pulpit, that isn't judgmental and divisive, I'll take you to church. That was my nice version, guys. This is his response to me. Undaunted, not bothered. Here are four churches. Go check them out and tell me which one you like. Right? The boldness that can come from different people. He's grounded in God. But the reality is, this 14-year-old is going to be talking about anywhere. He could have wanted me to take him anywhere. But that's not what he wanted. He wanted us to go to church together. So in the same time that he's talking to me about going to church and having a life-changing experience and I'm just, okay, whatever, I was complaining about it for four months while he's asking me. And my party friends started to go to church. And I was losing my party friends. I didn't know what that was about. So I went to one of the churches that he had mentioned. Several of my friends had gone there as well. And I went in ready to just sit there and hate it. Worship started, and I cried the entire time. I was thankful I was alone so nobody could see me. Because I ugly cry. It's not pretty. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I don't know why. I don't even know what's going on right now. I think it could be psychologically they did something. You know, I really thought that I don't know what I'm feeling, and I don't know how to process that. So over the several months that I started to go to church and take him to church, I somewhere in that several month period, I can't even tell you when, accepted Jesus into my life. The impact I was ready to make 
in someone's life eternally had to be made in my life first. Right? And God knew that. God works all those details. There's nothing that you can strip better than the way God strips things. So we're going to talk a little bit about the fight. So if we can put up the first scripture. I'm not going to say what it is, just in case you... There you go. I like it. Hebrews 12, 13. We're on the same page. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Okay? Part of being a fighter, part of being part of Jesus' family, we are designed to be fighters. That's what that really is. Melissa Hardwick spoke several weeks ago and she mentioned we are grafted into God's family. 100% true. I'm going to add on. Grafted into a family of Christ, which means we are conquerors in Christ. We are grafted into a family that fights. We're fighting for righteous things. We're fighting for good things. And we have to clear a path. He already knew Jesus, so he was clearing the path for me. He stayed steady and consistent, and he kept asking, will you go to church? Hey, this is why. It wasn't a, a throw scripture at you, fight. It wasn't. It was his heart. He just shared his heart. He shared what Jesus was doing in his life. Well, now, in turn, I'm clearing a path, and I didn't even realize it. Now he can go to church. Now he can go to the youth group. Now we can be consistent. But fighting is never just an easy thing. We don't fight the way the world fights, right? I mean, we could, but it's not going to be as effective. It's the world way. So we can't punch somebody in the face like we saw in the video and just knock someone out and be like, Jesus, we won. <laughs> right? You try that, it's not going to work at, at all, right? But God designed us for a fight where we can fight with his strength, where we can fight with the fruits of his spirit, gentleness and kindness, long-suffering, where we can have self-control, right? So he's working through those things in his way, and I didn't even know I was working through those things in mine. So once a week became twice a week. Once to church became every Sunday to church. Going to the youth group became consistent. Was it perfect? No, it was not perfect at all. But it was God. And it was amazing God working through his imperfect people. Right? So I'm, I'm feeling all that, so I want to share what that looked like for me. While we're doing that, he's still getting into sometimes poor decision making. Let's say that. Right? So I'm serving, he's serving. We're in church, we're going to church. Next thing I know, he gets into a physical fight with one of the pastors at the church. Right? That's what I said. I was like, we're here. You brought me to church. Now I'm like experiencing God and you get into a fist fight with a pastor? Okay, mind you, the pastor was amazing. The pastor didn't hurt him anything, restrained him, got him down. He was just angry. What did that open a door for? For me to talk to the youth pastors there. Like, how do we support this? How do we surround him? What does this look like? Next thing it looks like is me serving a youth minister. <laughs> so I was looking for easy, convenient, short time commitment. And God said, okay, that's fine. Right? But the reason I even share these examples is the differences that we're going to make are worth fighting for. So it's not easy. That's okay. Get up and fight. So it's not convenient and I have to restructure and reprioritize. That's okay. Get up and fight. It's worth fighting for. And our fights all look different. So, you know, I'm just explaining one story in my life, but the reality for some of us, it could, the fight could have been making it through the door this morning. The fight could have been the, the enemy and the spiritual attack that makes you feel like, I don't even want to get up. Or I've had a long week. Or does it even matter if I'm there? Right? Or if you have family, we don't have kids, but we have dogs. we got to get the dogs in the kennel, got to get the dogs fed. Our dogs have a lot of problems, we got to go through all the pills. All right, but someone else is saying, okay, my kid doesn't even want to get up. They're sleeping late. Maybe my husband's worked long hours and he's tired and wants to take the day off. Maybe I'm sitting there ready and my wife is still curling her hair. Right? I mean, all those things are possible. No, no. Just saying. Options here. But the reality is we all have a different fight. And when God calls you to do something, it might come up in a different way. And we have to go back to what it means to be fighters for Jesus. Right? We have to lean in on him for that strength and to move through. Galatians 5, 6 through 9. What is important is faith is expressing itself in love. You were running the race so well, who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. Now the false teaching is that God could be in the way. Oh, if you didn't go to church, it would be easier. Right? 
that we didn't have to get up, we didn't have to do those things, so the fight is something God did. It's not. Oh, God called me to do this, but it's hard. Okay, all those obstacles come from the enemy. God's not blocking this path for you. We just have to stay diligent and consistent. Reality is for a lot of the people around us, we have to model the behavior so they can see it, not just hear it. I can say all day long, hey, you need to be in a youth group for community, and you need to be in there so you can feel it, and you can have support, and you can have people redirect you to God. And everyone will say, amen. And then the question goes, well, my, are my parents going to like this? How does my mom get her support? How does my dad get that support? We have to model behavior. They don't see it. We tell kids to pray. Well, they have to see us praying. They have to experience being prayed with and prayed for. And all of those are fights, guys. I've been in moments myself where I'm just like, I don't know that I want to do what I'm asking you to do. Right? And then I have to have my heart check and go, okay, well, what am I part of or not? Uh, I'll be the first one to admit really vulnerably, who are the guys I lean on for male support? Right? For guys, it's so hard to build relationships. I need to have those things in line and check. And so that's a struggle. That's breaking through vulnerability. That's breaking through whatever it is that I'm being lied to about. We're going to jump to finish, guys, because we're really just breaking down this scripture. So first we talked about the good fight, right? And then he talked about the finish. I finished this race. So I want to jump into this first scripture there, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 26. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I will run, run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I'm not just faking it. So it's so important for us to know that when God calls us to do something, he calls us to finish our part because it's like a relay race. You're not called to do everything by yourself. It's a team sport, right? So for us, we are really in there moving through what we need to do. We are being, uh, our fight needs to be strong, but then who are we bringing along with us? If I felt like it made a difference to serve on the guest services team, who did I invite to serve with me? If I thought it made a difference to be part of beautiful women's group, I didn't personally, obviously, but who did I invite to come with me? It is a relay race where we're bringing someone along with us. So part of finishing strong is finishing your part and being consistent, but then the other part is bringing people with you, inviting them. We're going to go to faithful. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. God's word and God's work is never going to be useless or void. So every step you take, every step he asks you to take yields fruit when you don't know it. Every step takes you to the positive direction. I started to pray with my family. I was praying by myself and now I'm praying with the kids. Every step is important. Every step. I'm greeting people at the door and I'm hugging people. I don't know if it matters. You don't know what's behind the smile. You don't know who you hugged, shook a hand to, or were kind to that was having a great day or was having a horrible day and was going through brokenness. You don't know that, but it doesn't come back void. It is never useless. We want to make sure that we are being faithful in what we're doing and knowing that God is going to deliver on those things. That's not us. God delivers on it. So he wants to work through that. Our job is to stay faithful and knowing that what he promised he will deliver and what he deems is our fruit and what's going to be positive, we're going to see that even if it's not what we thought it was because we can't control that. My last scripture here, Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of the faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that, has so, easy, that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We have to remember that everything we do is not just about us. God wants to work through you a healing. He wants to work through you something powerful, but he also wants it to ripple out and affect other people. So when you mess up and you kick that off and stand back up, God, this is not for me. You're right, God. Align me back to where you want me to be. We are being righteous, but our right standing is for other people. 
they're going to see that. We have beautiful baptisms on Saturday. That's, that step for everyone is huge, right? That's also an example to the world of what you're standing for and fighting for. And there's faithfulness in that. And God wants us to remember that because we, He has to be our first love. We have to always go back to Him and get aligned. And you can bend to what God wants and things work out okay, but you can align yourself and let Him speak to your heart and you see things just flow in beautiful ways. You know, right now we've been talking so much about everything that God can do through anybody, right? And that's great, but it's multiplied when it's with Him. So I'm going to ask you, there may be people here that don't experience God that way. Maybe you don't know Him. Maybe you haven't accepted Him as your Savior. Maybe you haven't accepted His Lordship in your life, different parts of your life. Wherever you're at, I'd like everyone to close your eyes, bow your heads. You may not see me, but I can see you. And if there's anyone here who hasn't accepted Christ as their Savior, as the Lord of their lives, just slip up a hand. I'd love for you guys to repeat this prayer after me all together. God, I turn away from anything that's not of you. God, I'm chasing after you. I accept Jesus as my Savior, as the Lord of my life. And Lord, I pray to be with you and for all my days. Jesus' name, amen. Amen.